All right, let me say a line. I bet you can fill in the blank. If I say, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Well, that's not, that's not what this sermon is about. It's not about insurance. But it does tell us they've done a pretty good job of branding themselves, doesn't it? Because when you say that line, we know it. And, and their whole message is that, that they want to send the idea that they're available like a good neighbor whenever you need them. I don't know. They're not my insurance, so I don't know whether that's true or not. But uh, I know it is important to have good neighbors, isn't it? And the Bible teaches us that we should be good neighbors, and good neighbors being servants in the kingdom, and uh, with the focus on serving others for uh, the sake uh, of the kingdom and doing the work that we do for the sake of the kingdom. And all of us have been custom designed for service. Did you know that? God made you for service. God made you to serve Him. And you serve other people uh, in order to serve God. Uh, Jesus said, uh, if you've given a, a cup of cold water uh, to someone that needs a cup of cold water, he said, you've done it to him. And so we're created to serve. We are designed to serve. We're custom made. Peter, 1 Peter talks about how we have been designed uh, to serve God. Our greatest fulfillment in life comes, I really believe, when we learn uh, to serve. The famous, famous English uh, sculptor Henry Moore was asked uh, a question by a literary critic, uh, and uh, said this. He said, now that you're 80, you must uh, know the secret of life. What is it? And Moore uh, paused uh, just a bit, and then uh, he smiled before answering, and he said this. The secret to life, I've discovered, is to have a task, something you do your entire life, something you bring everything to every minute of the day for your whole life. And the most important thing is, it must be a task that you cannot possibly do. I think that's uh, pretty uh, wise. What he's saying is uh, that your life is to be consumed by this task. What is that task for the believer? It is to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but you can't do it without him. And he wants you to do it, so he has made provision, and he has equipped you and custom designed you and tailor-made you so that you could serve him. And God expects us to to serve Him and do so by serving others. In other words, the grace that has been lavished upon us uh, is to be lavished upon others. We are to serve them so that they will understand uh, who He is and all about His uh, grace. When I was growing up, um, we didn't have uh, the kind of uh, gas stations we have today. We had uh, full-service filling stations. How many of you remember full-service filling stations? Now, I was just a kid, I really was, I was just a kid when these things really existed in their heyday, and, uh, but I can remember when we would pull into a full-service station, and I can remember as a kid sitting in the back seat, and my, my dad, we, we never filled up. I, don't, I never asked my parents, did we not fill up because we couldn't afford to fill up, or was it just uh, get enough in a couple of three or four dollars? I can remember my parents saying, I need two dollars worth. And you tell an attendant to walk to your car, and two dollars when it's 19 cents a gallon will take you a long way. And I can remember that the attendant would walk to the window and say, "How can I help you?" And then he'd say, "Can I do your windshields? Would you like your windshields? You want me to check the air and your tires?" How many of you remember that full service stations? Wasn't that uh, wasn't that nice? You know, and that's the uh, that, and and. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we moved on from full-service stations. I remember by the time I was starting to drive, we still had some full-service stations. But then we went to a hybrid station. You remember that? You had full-service pumps, and you had self-serve pumps. And, uh, and the difference was, if you pulled up to a full-service pump, they would come out and do the same thing, just like a full-service station. But uh, it would be two or three cents more per gallon than if you pumped it yourself. Y'all remember that too, don't you? And, uh, and so, you know, sometimes you might just be too tired. Now, I'm a young guy. When I'm first starting to drive, I'm not about to pay an extra two or three cents for somebody to, to serve it. I can pump it and always kind of thought, you know, when you're a kid growing up, you think pumping gas is a neat thing until you have to pump it, right? And so, uh, but I remember those days. And then uh, eventually we moved uh, completely away from that to where we are today, where everything is self-serve. I guess there are probably a handful of kind of traditional classic stations around the country somewhere where you still have full service care, but it's a rare thing, isn't it? And now we call it self-service. 
In other words, you've got to take care of yourself, and uh, you don't take care of the guy behind you, and they don't take care of you. And the only time you talk with anybody that's at that, that filling station is if you, the machine didn't pre- uh, print your receipt, and you needed a receipt, or, or something went funky on the machine, or, and you had to go inside, right? It's times have changed, of course. And we're all okay with that. But here's the thing. Here's what I want you to do. We had full service, and now we have self-service. And I got to thinking about that in terms of the church today. It seems like to, uh, the church is a lot of more self-service than full service. And see, God has called us to be full service representatives of the kingdom of God. And that is, uh, instead of coming and saying, um, I'll just take care of myself, and then I'll, I'll go, and God says, I want you in the kingdom to be taken care of, not just yourself, I want you to be taken care of others. I want you to serve me by fully serving other people. God has called every one of us to ministry. He's called us to, to service. He's called us to war. Everyone in the kingdom is a soldier, and that's important. It's important to the success of God's work, and it's important to the success of God's church. It's important to the success of your home and the success of your work and your family. Every believer is to be a missionary. Every believer's home is to be a mission field. And every church is to be a missionary training center. And when we understand that we're called to be servants, we'll understand that we are called to fulfill the mission that God has given to us. I'm so proud of our team in Vermont. I just went up uh, uh, Wednesday and came back with them on, on Friday, and I don't, don't misunderstand. I did uh, uh, nothing. I preached in the chapel. I met with the, uh, the president and uh, uh, professor too, but uh, they did the work. And I'm so proud of them. And, uh, and you should know this because we're coming up. November is our big annual mission offering. You all remember that. Start praying about that, what you're going to give above and beyond your regular offering to, to help fund the five partnerships and missions that we have. But they bragged in chapel. I told our, I told our uh, deacons this morning, they just bragged and bragged about, about Ridgecrest. And the, the president stood up and said, I want to tell you all something to the professors and the students that were there. He said, I want to tell you something. These people don't just send teams up here, but he said they partner with us in, in innumerable ways. And he said, here's what I've learned about Ridgecrest Baptist Church. When they say they're going to be your partner, they mean it. And so I'm so glad we are. And you heard uh, Tim Bristow pray, by the way. He said, in the last year in the New England area, as a direct result of the college of their faculty, staff members, and students who are going out preaching in the community. Listen to this. Over 251 new believers have been baptized. Now, for us down here, we think, well, that's just kind of, you know, you ought to expect that sort of thing. And, and there. But I want to tell you, in New England, that is unheard of. In fact, the, the president told me, he said, Ray, he said, in my 15 years here in New England, I've never seen anything like it. Listen. They're making a difference, and in part, they're making a difference because you're involved in missions with them. We're all called to be involved in missions and in service to God. And I want to talk to you about that whole matter today of how to be a good neighbor for the kingdom of God. If you're physically able to do so, stand with me. I want to read our text to us this morning. I think this story of Jesus is uh, uh, one of the probably top three or four that people, uh, most every person has heard at least some form of. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Listen, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, that is, Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, "Uh, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. 
He went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Father, thank you. For the richness of your word, remind us, convict us, Father, that we are servants of the Most High King. God, instill in us, restore in us a passion to be your servants on the journey that you've put us in. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Now, this story is familiar, as I said, probably one of the most familiar of all uh, uh, the modern church, at least. And um, it actually begins, the story begins with two questions from a lawyer. And uh, now this man knew the law, the man that asked Jesus these questions. He, he knew the law. He knew God's law, which, by the way, was the basis of all of their law, civil and spiritual, religious law. And uh, this man knew it. And he wasn't really looking for answers because he already knew the law. And uh, what he was really doing is trying to trick Jesus, as oftentimes we saw uh, in the life of Jesus, uh, questions would be thrown at him to twist him, because they never could could twist him up, and they wanted to undermine his work and undermine the, the, the ministry that he had. And so this guy wasn't really looking for answers. He was trying to trick Jesus. And Jesus, his answer threw the man a curve, didn't it? And so this man, after hearing the first response by Jesus, decides, well, if that didn't get him, this one surely will. And so he says kind of sarcastically, then who is my neighbor then? Tell me who my neighbor is. And Jesus' answer to this second question points this passage toward uh, the legal teacher, and it points us toward our responsibility to not only know truth, but to apply the truth we live. It's a parable about love more than it is law. And uh, there is built into this story a a tension. The tension is between uh, the Jews uh, versus the Samaritans. You see, Samaritans were, uh, they had had interbred, they had intermarried uh, among the Assyrians who had settled in the Palestine region. And so uh, the Jews looked at them with disdain and contempt. They didn't, uh, they didn't represent who, who the Jews thought they should. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with them. They considered them outcasts uh, in society. And they, and in fact, they, they avoided them at all possible co- uh, uh, cost. And so this story is about uh, the characters, really. This story is about the characters. If you understand the characters and how they're responding to what's going on, you'll understand the message uh, that Jesus is communicating, was communicating to the lawyers, communicating to us. And there was one man in trouble, of course, presumably a Jew, and then there were three others who uh, really formed the basis of the teaching that Jesus is communicating. But let me tell you what this story is not about. This story is not about uh, seeing a need and trying to meet every need you see. That's not what this story is about. In fact, you can't do that. This story is about being a servant of God right where you are. It's about being God's person, God's man, God's woman, right where God has put you and taking advantage of the ministry opportunities that he brings across your path and your path brings to you. Now, uh, these characters in this story are mentioned by Jesus to form a contrast, a comparison, if you will. So, that you and I can determine which of the three we're most like. And as I studied the passage, I thought, well, there, there are three types of people in this parable, aren't there? First, there, there is, and you can note this on your outline, there's the convictional person. The convictional person. What do I mean by that? Well, verse 31 talks about the priest. Notice the priest. He, he knew well the law. Just like that teacher of the law, the priest knew the law himself. He knew it well. 
But having knowledge and conviction of the truth is not a a substitute for doing the truth, all right? And you can have all the convictions in the world, but if those convictions are not applied to the way you live, they are absolutely useless. He had, he had the convictions. He was the priest. He knew the right things, but he did not practice them. Second, there is the complacent person. And uh, you notice the Levite in verse 32. This man, uh, by the way, a Levite, well, his role was to be an assistant in the temple. He assisted the priest. He wasn't the priest. He assisted the priest in the temple. But this person who is simply complacent or apathetic, uh, he's the person who knows there's a need but determines that someone else can take care of it. There's a need that God has brought to him, and he just chooses to let somebody, he ignores it. He's, He's complacent about it. So you have the convictional person, you have the complacent person, and then third, you have the compassionate person. There's the compassionate person. And that is, of course, this Samaritan we see reflected in verse 33. You see, and what's interesting and why Jesus even uses this kind of contrast is because the Samaritan in the minds of the priest and the Levite, the Samaritan would be the last person on earth that would go and do ministry to this person in need. Why? Because the person in need was a Jew. This Samaritan wouldn't do it. Think about it. The priest, a Jew, wouldn't help a Jew that was in the ditch, left for dead. A Levite who was a Jew wouldn't help a a, 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 a a victim in the ditch who was left for dead, but the Samaritan did. And this blew all the standards for ministry. Why would he do it? He had no reason. The Jews were always hostile to the Samaritans. They didn't like each other. They didn't get along, but there was a need. There was an opportunity for ministry. And I wanted to remind you of something. God frequently accomplishes his greatest ministry through those who most presume to be least qualified. God often does his greatest ministry. Now, that's good news for all of us because you may think sometimes, well, I'm not qualified to to be a servant of God, to do ministry for God. But I want to tell you this morning, you are more than qualified, not because of who you are, though you've been custom designed to serve God. You are more than qualified because of the Spirit of God that lives in you. And God loves to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, Paul said. And this is a reminder that God prizes, listen, availability, and he uses those who simply and obediently do his will. But what I want to focus on is not that. I don't want to focus on what the others did. I don't want to focus on, I don't want to spend a lot of time what the priest uh, did or didn't do or the Levite did or didn't do. What I want to focus on in this passage is far more about what the Samaritan did than what the others didn't do. So I want to show you five truths about ministry, uh, being a good neighbor. Five truths about ministry to your neighbor. First of all, I want you to see in verse 33, ministry is relational. It is relational. It requires a personal connection. It requires personal contact. Both the priest and the Levite made a point to avoid contact. Do you notice that? But not the Samaritan. It's relational. It's personal. Uh, the priest and the Levite went out of their way to go out of their way. Do you get that? They went out of their way to go out of their way. But the Samaritan went out of his way to do ministry. You can impress people from a distance, but you can only touch them up close. You can look good from a distance, but you can only make a difference in their life up close. Relationship is essential to ministry. It enables you to see the need, to know the need, and to respond personally to the need. I want to say something to you this morning. If you don't have a small group, you need a small group. You need a connection group. Do you know why you need a connection group? Well, one, because of the, the Bible teaching you'll get. Number two, because of the fellowship you'll get. But listen to this. Number three, because of the care you'll get. You see, in the small group, you get the care. The Samaritan's care is found in those small connections because they become real personal, right? You know each other. You know what's going on in each other's life. And that's just, I want to encourage you to to be involved if you're not. But the fact is, you can't do ministry from a distance. 
And that's why so many people are needed to do the work of ministry. That's why each of us are commissioned by God. God has brought a number of relationships across our paths. I wonder, have you ever stopped to ask, God, why have you brought these relationships in my life? Why have you connected me with this person or this person? Why, God, have you, have you brought them across my path? Is it for my growth? Maybe. Is it for their growth? Maybe. Is it for ministry? Maybe. But it's a, there's a reason. I, there are no coincidences with God, and there are, no, there are no accidental paths of the people of God. And so ministry is relation. I want to tell you something. It'll change your life if you'll go back out into your world this week, and when somebody comes across your path, say, God, is there a reason that we intersected? It may just be to pray for them. They may tell you something. But ask yourself, God, is there a reason? It'll begin to change the way you live because you'll begin to look at every, everything that happens as a new opportunity for ministry. And you say, well, what if nothing manifests? Don't worry about it. Just be conscious that God is bringing uh, people across our paths all the time, and you can't do ministry from a distance. It has to be up close and personal. Here's the second thing I want you to know about ministry. Ministry is emotional. Did you notice verse 33 where he said uh, that uh, when he, he went to him, it also said that he, when he came to him, he, he saw the man had compassion on him. Now, these are natural enemies, the Jews and the Samaritans. But when he saw this man in need, all of that stuff broke down. He just saw a man in need, and he felt compassion. Ministry is emotional. The Samaritan put his heart into the matter. That's the motivating drive, this compassion. is the motivating drive behind the ministry. His compassion caused him to do what the religious folks wouldn't do. Notice their religion didn't motivate them, but their comp this guy's compassion motivated him. Ministry is emotional. And I think when it comes to our emotion, uh, there, there, there are several kinds of people. There, there are some who serve by compulsion, maybe even from some guilt. You know, the, the preacher preached a message on service and made everybody feel really bad if they weren't serving. And so some people serve by compulsion. They, they feel guilty, and so they, they begin to serve that way. It's, I, look, look, I'd rather you serve by <laughs> compulsion than not serve at all. But some folks serve that way. Then there are some people who serve by obedience, but not with joy. I'm just doing what God wants me to do. Praise God. They look like they've been sucking on green persimmons. You know, praise God, I, here I am to serve. Look, there are some who serve by obedience. They're obeying God, they're serving, but they, they're missing the joy that God wants them to experience in the service. And this is good to serve, even if it's by obedience, but it's not quite best. I want you serving by obedience. That's enough. If for no other reason, you just serve by obedience. But listen, there's more to service than just serving out of obedience. Some, there's a third kind that serve by compassion. And you know where that compassion comes from? It does, it's not some self-generated compassion. It is the compassion of God that has been bestowed upon us. And what he has done for me, I can't help but do for someone else. And so now we see people through the same eyes that God sees people. We see people as Jesus sees people. I love the passage in Matthew 9 where Jesus comes up on a hill and he looks down at the multitude and the Bible says, and he felt compassion for them for they were like sheep without a shepherd. We need to ask God, help us to see the people not as enemies. You know, in this day and age, and there's an increasing polarization between culture and Christianity, and that's going to increase, okay? And we have to be careful that our hearts don't become hard and say, you do your thing and we'll do our thing and we don't have to cross paths. The fact is, we need to see everybody the way God sees them, as in need. And when we do, we'll have a compassion. And that compassion, listen, that compassion, when it's partnered with compulsion and obedience, changes the way we do ministry. It brings the joy back into the work. But if we, only, if we only serve by compulsion or only by obedience, then most likely at some point you're going to burn out. 
There are people probably here in this room today who are serving God from compulsion and and you've become dry, and you're, you're empty in that service, and you're, you're spiritually lifeless. And you might even say, yeah, pastor, that's me, and in my heart, I, I think I ought to just quit. But let me tell you something, quitting isn't the answer. What you need is renewed passion. You, you need to refocus on how God sees people and ask God to, to give you a new kind of passion for people and for the need around you. And to do that, listen, to do that, you know how you do that? You have to die to self. That's what Jesus said to those who came and said, we want to be with you. We want to be on your team. We want to do ministry. And he said, great, pick up your cross daily and deny yourself. Well, the, the way we get there is we get our eyes off of ourself. Selfishness is a great killer of ministry. How many churches have been sidetracked, destroyed, or ruined by selfishness? What happened to the old passion for God sometimes, the old passion to serve God, the old passion to give and do whatever, whatever is needed to be done. What happened to that? In many cases, I'll tell you what happened. You did. You got over your love for God. You got over your, your relationship and the, the intimacy of knowing God. There's a time, by the way, all of us, including preachers, have to get before God and say, restore to me the joy of my salvation. You know, that time where you serve God, you wanted to do anything, anything, anything. It's why we love new believers, because new believers are so excited about serving God. They're so excited about obeying God. They'll show up, they'll do, they'll give, they'll, what I need, tell me what I need to do, where I need to go. And that's how we ourselves, we have to learn from the new Christian. There are a lot of things a new Christian has to learn from us, right? But we have to learn some things from the new Christian. We have to, we have to see the passion that, that we had and hopefully still have. We have to learn to be excited about the work and the restored passion of God for our life. Here's the third thing I want you to say about ministry. Ministry is intentional. Verse 34, look at verse 30. He went to him. The Samaritan went to uh, where the man was. Now listen, ministry rarely happens by accident, does it? You know, some years ago we adopted a, a kind of a, a theme. It was actually an annual theme, but it carried on, and it needs to carry on, and we'll probably revise it a bit in the, the uh, coming year. But it was, uh, we called it out of the pew and into the street. Now we can say out of the seat and into the street. But, uh, and, and I want to tell you something. God used it and has used it powerfully uh, in our community and through our church as we began to say it's not enough for us to, to sit and take in what we take in, we got to give out. We got to get it out there. It has changed some of the way we do missions. It has changed uh, some of the ways that we do community service and all of those different things. Why? Because we realize it's not enough to take in. God feeds us so that we can give it away. And we need to be reminded of that. It is intentional. People rarely come to us. That's why we have mission teams and mission projects. Uh, that's why we go to where they are. And Paul said in Romans 10, he said, how will, they pre uh, how will they preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. You see, the Samaritan may not have started out looking for an opportunity to minister. There's no indication that he set out. He was, he was going somewhere. We're not even sure where he was going. But he didn't sit out looking for an opportunity to minister. But his eyes were open. And so when he saw the opportunity to make a difference, where the others were looking to avoid ministry, he takes advantage of it. How does intentional ministry happen? Well, that's a good question. It happens by looking for ways. It happens by being sensitized, as I said earlier. Stop waiting for someone to ask you, by the way, to do ministry. Stop waiting and say, well, somebody just asked me, I would do this. You know, stop waiting for somebody to ask you. Instead, come and say, it's time for me to get to work. What, what can I do? How, where, I'll, I'll serve any place. You say, well, it may not be in line with my gifts. I want to tell you something. Just start serving. And God will get you to the right place if you'll be open to him, if you're willing to say, God, I will, I will serve. I like what one guy said. He said, some people, it's time for them to get off their blessed assurance. 
and get into the battle for souls of men and women. You know, you can do it in a lot of different ways. You say, well, I, it, it may not be that you're a teacher. You say, I'm not a teacher. That's okay. Maybe you are. You can teach or you can serve in a number of ways in a connection group or department. You can be a greeter or you can help us get people to the right places and uh, just to, uh, be a part of welcoming people. That's an important part. Work at our welcome center. You can love on babies. I love babies a lot right now. You can love on babies. I mean, you can sing in the, the choir. I mean, they're a fantastic choir. You can sing in the choir. You can play in the orchestra. There are lots of ways to, to give yourself for the good of the kingdom and the glory of God. You can work with students and children. You can visit the sick. You can be a part of our, our shepherd ministry, all of these kinds of things. But stop waiting on somebody to, to pick you out. Come and say, hey, how can I help? Where can I help? And I will do whatever uh, you want me to do. Listen, that is the pathway to finding what God's designed you for. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary who carried the gospel to uh, inland China, and I've told you many times before, but he's one of the handful of folks every Christian ought to read. Hudson Taylor, George Mueller, uh, these guys, you ought to read about their life. And he opened up inland China to the gospel, Hudson Taylor did. And uh, he was approached by a man one time after he spoke uh, in England. He was approached by a man with one leg. And the man said to uh, Hudson Taylor, he said, I want to go to China as a missionary. And Hudson Taylor looked back at him and said, why do you think you can be a missionary when you, you have only one leg? And the man replied back and said, because I don't see any men with two good legs, legs going. I want to ask you something. Do you have two good legs? Put them in use for the kingdom of God. Say, I can do something. I can do something. It's time to get intentional about serving God. Why? Because there are people, listen, in ditches. And you can make a difference for God with your life. Here's a fourth thing I want you to see about ministry. Ministry is perpetual. Did you notice this about the Samaritan, verses 34 and 35? He went to him, he bound up his wound, poured oil and wine on him, he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him, it says. And then look at this, the next day he took out money, he gave it to the innkeeper, and he said, you take care of him, whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. You get what's going on there? That's Ministry that didn't stop, it continued, perpetual ministry. His ministry to this wounded man continued beyond his first contact. It included the next day and the days that would follow uh, while he was away. Now, I'm not, this is a, this is a parable. It is uh, principles to teach us, but you, ministry is something you are to be engaged in from now until eternity. And Jesus ministered that way. He ministered from the time he arrived in this world until the day he left. From the grave to the tomb he ministered. We're to do the same thing. He tells us at the end of this parable, you do likewise. And listen, I want to tell you, you can't resign from God's purpose for your life. You can't resign from God's purpose for your life. You, you can drift away from God. But you can't retire, you can't resign, or you can't renegotiate his purpose for you. Paul writes in Romans 11 and says, God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. There never is a point in time where you can say, God, I, I will check out from, from my purpose. Let somebody else do it. No, you can run from it. Jonah did. You can run from the purpose, but you can't resign from the purpose. You may be here this morning, and you may have served a great deal. There are a lot of you in this place who have served a great deal in the kingdom of God, and ministry is full of highs and lows, and you, you maybe are just a bit discouraged. You're tired, but don't quit. Don't stop serving. You, you may think, I'm not accomplishing very much, but anything done for God is not wasted. Don't stop. You think about this, the college that we've just come back from and whom we support and encourage in so many ways, they've been going since 2008. And just this year, were they able to report 251 conversions as a result of their work, but not much prior to that. 
And you know, it could, you could easily get discouraged, couldn't you, in the work? You don't see fruit. You know, one of the things I pray for our missionaries is God give them fruit. There's nothing like fruit to encourage, is there? Fruit, fruit. But a lot of times it takes a while for that fruit to manifest itself, and there's highs and lows. I'm often asked, do I ever get discouraged? You better believe I do. A recent statistic revealed that in this country, an average of 120 pastors quit every week. There's a saying in pastoral ministry, it goes like this, never resign on Monday. You know, because you've just come off Sunday, and, and frankly, everybody's not as spirit-filled as you might think they are on Sunday. With complaints, and this could have been better, or this didn't happen, or I'm upset. And so they tell pastors, you know, I heard this when I was young, never resign on Monday. But I tell you, there have been some Sundays that I've wanted to resign Yes, we all get discouraged, but we must learn to do, and I've learned to do what David did. It says in the Psalms that David encouraged himself in the Lord. And there are times when we have to do that. You have to do that, and I have to do that. We have to look and say, this thing is so much bigger than any one of us, and we encourage ourselves in the Lord, just like David but here's a fifth thing I want you to know about ministry. Ministry is sacrificial. We see that again reflected in verses 34 and 35. I read some years ago about two teenage girls who decided to do something good for their neighbor. We're talking about being a good neighbor. They decided to do something good for their neighbor. They, bat, they baked a batch of fresh cookies, and they walked over and put them on their neighbor's doorstep. She sued them. The neighbor did. Juanita Renee Young, and she sued them in a Colorado court, and the court forced these two teenage girls to pay this woman $900 in damages. And um, she said, I was so mystified by the event of these girls leaving cookies on my front porch that it produced an anxiety attack. And the judge ordered these girls, can you believe that? to pay for this woman's doctor visit. And then the woman said, I just hope these girls learned a lesson. I think they probably did. They had a sick neighbor. I mean, really sick. Listen to me. Ministry will cost you sometimes. Because sometimes people will mistake your ministry as something nefarious. You're up to something. But sacrifice is required. Did you notice that the Samaritan's ministry cost him something? And ministry will cost us something. It took time from his schedule. I ask you do, you, do you ever adjust your schedule for God? I mean, I know we all do for recreation. We adjust our schedule for school and work and play. But do we adjust our schedule for ministry and for the kingdom of God? It took time. He had to sacrifice time. He had not planned on that. I'll tell you what else, it was inconvenient. As I said, he didn't start out on this trip planning to get involved in the life of another person. He had to interrupt his plans. He had to change his present priorities. It was inconvenient. And then third, it cost money. Ministry always costs money. God has ordained it so. Ministry always costs money, and money is a test. It's a test of our trust. It's a test of our commitment and our belief in the, the higher purposes of the kingdom of God. I want to tell you something tragic. If our economy went south, the first person that it, that would, be, uh, that it would be taken out on would be God. If our economy went south, the first person that it would be taken out on would be God. It took time. It was inconvenient. It cost money. And then it required effort and energy. It was physically demanding on this man. And ministry requires more than just your affirmation and encouragement. It, it requires your, your willingness to sacrifice. There's an old story told about a king. And this king was informed that he was going to have to have a heart transplant. And so consequently, uh, he began to, he was a much loved king and his constituents, when they found out, they began to send in messages, hey, my heart for the king, my heart for the king, yeah, I, I will give my heart up so the king can live. 
And the king was so overwhelmed by the volume of people saying, I will sacrifice my heart so that you can live, that he finally decided, I don't know how to, to determine who, who sacrifices their heart for, so that I can live. And so he called them together one day in a big uh, courtyard area around the, uh, the castle. And he stood out on the balcony before the people, and the people were chanting, my heart for the king. My heart for the king, my heart for the king. And he calmed them down. And he said, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know how to select a person. And he said, so I've decided to do it this way. I have this feather here. And we're going we're gonna to float the feather out over the crowd. And as that feather floats, whoever it lands upon will be the person to give their heart in exchange. And the people roared loudly, yeah, yeah, yeah. They celebrated, and then they began to scream, uh, my heart for the king. The feather went out. My heart for the king. My heart for the king. And as the feather floated out of the crowd, my heart for the king. <laughs> my heart for the king. <laughs> it's one thing to talk about sacrifice. It's one thing to affirm sacrifice. It's another thing to sacrifice, isn't it? And you know why we have to do that is because it glorifies God. Serving God glorifies God. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But not only does it glorify God, I want to tell you, we must serve because we've been created for ministry. Isaiah, the prophet, wrote, I, the Lord, have called you for a righteous purpose, and I will hold you by your hand. I will keep you, and I will make you a covenant for the people and a light to the nations. Now, you know, there are a lot of people today telling us that uh, the goal of God for our lives is money, happiness, and uh, uh, getting. But God's goal for your life is not money. God may bless you materially, but that's not his goal. He'll bless you so you can, uh, you can use it for his glory. But his goal is for maturity. His goal is for ministry. God's goal for you is not happiness. That may surprise you in this culture we live in. God's goal for you is not happiness. God's goal for you is holiness. God's goal is not that you be a getter. It is that you be a giver. And ministry is a part of that creative purpose of God. Just like he said to Isaiah, you're called to it, you are conditioned for it, you are capable of it, and you must be committed to it. And all service rises and falls on your commitment. And then I would say to you, you must be a servant in the kingdom because the need is great. Jesus said this, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Listen. Listen, he says, I'm telling you, open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Jesus said the harvest is there. That's the ministry. He said, we're just waiting for workers to come and work and do the work of ministry. Did you know every day in this country over 6,600 people die? That's twice as many as died in 9-11. We never talk about that, though. We say we lost 3,000, and boy, what a pain. It was because of the painful way we lost them. But every day in this country, over 6,600 people die. That's why the need is great. And people are in trouble. When Jesus looked at that crowd, he felt compassion because he knew they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were worn out. They, they needed help. They needed direction. The number of troubling, troubled people in our world today is just overwhelming, hurting, lost people. They're everywhere. They're in our neighborhoods. They're in our offices. They're in our civic clubs. They're even in this building today. You can't minister to everyone. You can't. And this isn't a parable to say, minister to everyone and everything you see that is a need. No, no, no. You can't do that. But you can minister to some. You heard the story of the boy and the starfish on the seashore? 
a whole bunch of starfish had washed up along the seashore, and he was walking by hundreds of them, hundreds of them. He was picking up, throwing them in back in the ocean, picking one up, throwing it back in the ocean. Finally, a, an older gentleman sees him and says, Son, don't you know you can't save all of those uh, starfish? There are just too many. And the little boy, in great wisdom, he, he looks at the one he's holding, and he said, I know that, but it makes a difference to this one. You can't save them all. You can't get them all straightened out. You can't fix everything out there. But you can, you can make a difference in some. So get started. Get started. Make your life count forever. And this morning, God extends to us a call. It's a call to service, to get involved in ministry. But I want to tell you, it's also a call to surrender to His Lordship. Wherever you go, whatever you want, I'm in. And it's a call to salvation. You see, some here today may have never truly trusted Christ as their Savior. This is that call. You can't serve a Savior you don't know. And I invite you to come and meet Him today. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the commission and the call, the competency, all of those things that you have enabled in us that we might serve you. And I pray this morning for those, some who are tired, they're, they're feeling burnt out, God, and they're dry spiritually. Would you restore to them the joy of their salvation, get their eyes off of how they feel and help them to reestablish the, a focus on you and your word and talking with you in prayer. There are others, Father, in this place today, and they've never really served. They just haven't understood the the reason they were created, but they were created to serve and help them today to begin saying, God, my eyes are open. I'll begin looking for the place and places and opportunities to serve you. And I will. And then, Lord, there are those in this place who need to respond to the call of salvation, to come and give their life to you. Would you help them to have the courage to take that step in Jesus' name? Amen. Would you stand with me for our invitation time? I'll be here at the front. Our staff are going to be here across the front as well. I invite you in the balcony of this ground floor to slip out from where you're seated. Come and take one of us by the hand. Say, here's a decision that I'm making this morning. Maybe I'm coming to receive Christ as my Savior. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. That's the call of salvation. And I want to be saved by Christ. He died for you. He loved you. You don't have to jump through any hoops. You just have to call. As many, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, the Scripture says. You may be here this morning and you just want to come and kneel around the altar and pray. I hope you'll do that. Take advantage of that. You may be here this morning and say, you know what? I'm looking for a family, a church family, a church home to become a part of. And I want Ridgecrest to be that church home. We'd love to have you in this place. Maybe there's some other decision, a call to full-time ministry of sorts or whatever. Whatever it is, you listen to him. As Tim and the choir lead us, we sing. Words are on the screen right now. Balcony, ground floor, slip out. You come on. Well, today we've been talking about uh, using our lives for the purpose in which they were created, and that is to glorify God, to serve the kingdom of God. And we do that by being involved right here and now in ministry and the opportunities to minister to people that God brings across our path. But uh, to do that, you've got to first have a relationship with God. And that happens when you and I put our trust in Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And you can do that today, right where you are. You can call on Him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not might be, but will be saved. You can do something like this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me, for dying on a cross for my sins. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need you. And I invite you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and be my Savior. Now, that is a prayer He has promised to hear. And so I encourage you to make that uh, prayer to Him if you've never trusted uh, Christ as your Savior. Then we'd love to help you in that new relationship. You'll see contact information on the screen in front of you. And we'd like to get you started right. Uh, we have some growth material we'd love to send to you. It's free. Uh, there are no strings attached. But let us know about your de decision to follow Christ. And then, of course, to all of those who are watching, um, all of us need a church home, a church family to connect with. And if you do not have one already, let me invite you to come and visit with us here at Ridgecrest. On Sunday mornings, we have uh, two uh, worship services. We have an 815. We call it a blended style worship service. 
And then we have a, a, a 1050 contemporary style service. It's a very relaxed, casual, uh, band driven. In both of those services, the message will be the same. Um, but we just invite you to come and attend the one that maybe stylistically in terms of music and worship style might be your preference. But by all means, come and visit with us if you uh, do not already have a church home. And then, of course, check us out on the website. A lot of information about Ridgecrest there. Our, uh, our site address is uh, www.rbcdothan.org. And there you can find out about our various ministries, about events that are coming, um, times, schedules. Uh, you can connect with us on live stream, uh, check out our podcasts, uh, all sorts of uh, ways to discover what's going on here at Ridgecrest. I hope you'll check our website out. And then like us on all the social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We have a presence there, and we'd love for you to be one of our followers as well. Well, today I hope you've been encouraged by God's Word. I've enjoyed sharing it with you. And I look forward to doing the very same thing next week at this same time on this channel. So I hope you'll tune in again. And until then, may God bless you.